Oh. Oops. Oh. Oh, You're strong. Up. This is a really live mic. I, I don't know if I should have this mic. This up. mic is a little bit too live. Maria. <laughs> this mic, might this mic is a little. little feedback. Oh, I'm just whispering. Probably just use it for the whole table. Hello? <laughs> I mean, that's far away from you. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's super live. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. don't have student board members tonight. Um, maybe they'll be here. I think my mic might also have a little feedback. Good evening. It is 7 o'clock. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Dr. Midzik, has this meeting been posted? Yes, it has. Okay, roll call will show that all five board members are present. And any word on the student board members? They may be at musical rehearsal across the hall. I have not okay. checked. All right, so they are excused. Um, so we'll begin tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Uh, we have some visitors in the crowd tonight. Um, we always love starting with this. It's a Panther Pride moment. Tonight we're going to be featuring College Park Elementary School. I don't know if Dr. Midzik, do you want to do some introductions? I welcome Mr. Michael Brock to the microphone where he can share information and introduce you to his team. Good evening. Um, I am Michael Brock, the principal at College Park, um, and very proud principal at College Park. Um, last year we came and we shared, uh, I came with uh, Dr. Croner and we shared a lot of information. And uh, we are really switching up this year. Um, our focus for um, our presentation is really about communities, um, the classroom community, the Greendale community, and the global community. Um, but before we start, let's get grounded in why do we exist as a public school system. We exist to make sure that all students belong and they are empowered to learn, grow, and engage as part of a global community. And obviously that starts at the, the micro level of within our classrooms and it goes to the macro level of the global community. Uh, we are really always continuing to strive to cultivate excellence in every single student. And I think the work that we do every day further, furthers that cause. Um, the College Park community, is that? I'm going to pass it to Dr. Croner. Sorry, I almost stepped on your toe. It's all good. Good evening, everybody. Um, so last year, we did a lot of work around um, high leverage instructional strategies um, with the staff, and we used John Hattie's work. Um, he has a book called Visible Learning, and what he did is he did a meta-analysis of all the research on all the different things that could potentially impact student learning. And he put all of the findings together and started churning out effect sizes. And within those effect sizes, the stronger they were, the more that they, the research has shown that they impact student achievement and student outcomes. So we went through um, a lot of different high leverage instructional strategies last year. But the reason I bring you back to this is um, collective efficacy out of anything that John Hattie studied has the highest impact on student achievement. And building community within our school 
impacts that collective efficacy. And what collective efficacy really is, is teachers' beliefs about their abilities to collectively impact student outcomes. So when students have, or when teachers have high self-efficacy, a high belief in their ability to impact student outcomes, and they share those beliefs with their colleagues, that has the highest impact out of anything on the outcomes of our students. So by building community, we are impacting our collective efficacy, which allows us to further um, where we take our student in their achievement. Um, so today, we wanted to focus on just a few types of community that we have at College Park um, and beyond College Park. So College Park is unique because it lends itself um, with the open concept to really develop that community. Everybody's in and out of each other's classrooms all the time. Kids are interacting with each other. Teachers are interacting with each other. And um, there's a lot of really beautiful, creative things happening. So our classroom communities um, are building collective efficacy, and we're going to talk about that today um, in a few ways. And Jesse is going to be talking a little bit about um, how we're developing student self-efficacy within those classroom communities in the context of math. Um, the Greendale community, we're looking at our Character Strong program extension that our culture and climate team um, won an award for last year. Um, and they're doing really great work with all of it again this year. So we'll hear a little bit more about that. And then our worldwide community, which um, our fifth grade team um, was, I'm going to let Sarah Totero fill you in on the specifics of that, but it's really exciting because um, they're getting, the students are getting to engage with um, somebody who is a worldwide explorer. So, all right. Um, <laughs> do you want to go to the next slide? I should say, okay. So this is just a few um, photos of the beautiful things happening, our kids engaging in learning all around the building, teachers engaging with our students. Um, and with that, I will pass it off to Jesse Bayer. Hi, I'm Jesse Bayer, and I'm the math interventionist at College Park. Um, last year, if you could go to the next, thank you. Um, well, each year in the fall, students participate in a, um, a math assessment that assesses automaticity as well as just their regular um, math skills. And we found that 25% of our students in the fall of 2022 were within the at-risk area for fact fluency. So as a staff, we came together and thought about, well, this is an area of need to help students build these skills. And teachers wrote a grant for the Reflex program. And we received that grant. And students in grades two through five participated in that program throughout the school year. Reflex is a unique program that's very motivating and engaging and also creates an individual path for each student based on their fluency needs. Um, and then in the spring of 2023, students took that same assessment for automaticity and 90% of um, students fell within the proficient or advanced range for fact fluency. If you could go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and so then we thought, well, this is great. And we were even more excited to see how students retained those fact fluency skills than this fall of 2023. So this graph shows each group of students and how they improved um, their fact fluency from fall to spring and then retained that information and those skills in the following um, fall of 2023. So all grade levels that participated in Reflex, 90% um, were proficient in the area of fact fluency. So we are very excited then also to continue this program this year through a grant from the Greendale Education Foundation so that we can continue to help students build those skills. And I'm just gonna follow up on that. Yeah. <laughs> I can't help myself. My students, I'm a second grade teacher, Stephanie Uden at College Park, and my students absolutely 
thrive on reflex and they look forward to it every single day. It's one of our rotations during math time and they're motivated by getting the green light and they're always excited when they, they can see the fact families that they have successfully you know, achieved and they're ready to share that information with you and it's just, it's exciting for them to have that program and be motivated to keep going and learn those facts. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to the rest of my team. Um, we are the Culture and Climate Committee at College Park, and our goal is to build that community um, between our staff, our students, and our families. Hi, I'm Kate Searing, a kindergarten teacher at College Park. Um, coming out of COVID and like those crazy years following with all of the changes within the buildings, we really felt a need to reestablish and to strengthen our relationship with with home. So to, to strengthen the school to home connection. Um, and within College Park, one of the ways that we've always done that is through literature. And every month we have a shared book that we read um, that always connects to our SEL curriculum. Um, so we, we took that route and we developed our Read at Home Read Together program. and um, through a grant from the foundation, we were able to fund the program last year. And um, with the success that we had, we are continuing again this year. And so our motto or slogan behind that was one book, one, wow, I can't read all the way from there. One conversation and one shared experience, which I should know because I came up with it. <laughs> all right, next slide, please. Um, but what we did was, once we received that grant, we went into action and we figured out how are, we gonna, how are we going to prepare to successfully launch this? Because it's not just putting the books into our students and our families' hands, but it's making sure that the book is accessible to all and that those conversations are truly shared. And so what we did was we purchased the books and with the help of our wonderful office staff and with some families, we got those envelopes packed with the books and the literacy guides that would help families walk through the books. We onboarded our teachers and we helped them, or they helped us, I should say, to create audio files of all of the chapters. So for students who maybe didn't have a uh, grown up at home to read with them, they would still be able to listen to each of the chapters. And then we made sure that our teachers within the classroom gave students opportunities to listen in case they didn't have a way to do so at home. We also made sure we brought the entire school together to launch the book. And I read the first chapter. I should say my then one and a half year old sat on a rocking chair and he had the book and got all of the kids excited because my son's name is Thor and there is a character in the book named Thor. So the kids, once they got that connection, I had everyone running up in the hall to me to tell me about that. Um, and then we moved into... Um, the next part, which was that action. And we did weekly announcements to remind students and families, like, this is what you need to read. We sent blurbs home to share with families. Classrooms had conversations each week, so it was that shared conversation where everyone was participating and like, this is what you read and this is what is happening with our character. And then we had to celebrate. And by the time we were done, we made sure that um, we came together and part of our spaghetti dinner, our PTO dinner and raffle, which is one of our biggest events at our school. Uh, families were able to uh, participate in a trivia contest and it was very popular and there may or may not have been a raffle basket to go with that. But that, that did not stop people from coming in or may have encouraged them. And then we also made sure that we were sharing out photos throughout. So families got to see kids reading at home, snuggled up with their animals. Um, it wasn't just the students, it was moms, dads, brothers, sisters, and it was just a really great thing to see. Um, so really everything that we did with this program was grounded in our um, Character Strong um, SEL program and we wanted to make sure that we were hitting a lot of the components um, that really shape our character education. So um, the book we chose, the activities that went with it, all supported our, you know, our character traits of respect, gratitude, empathy, honesty, cooperation, um, not only with the characters that were in the book, but what we were displaying in the classroom, um, with the community that we were building with other parents, um, what we were showing cooperatively in the building with teachers reading together and discussing the book. Um, and so we really wanted to make sure that we were focused on the whole picture. 
um, and bringing all of those character traits together um, in a way that extended beyond the classroom and went into everybody's homes. Um, and so I think it was really successful and um, we're gonna continue to do that again this year with a new read aloud um, or book for the whole community and um, we're gonna still focus on these character traits. And so with that, we also just wanted to take an opportunity to say thank you because as much as we are continuing our work that our district has put forth through our SEL curriculum, Character Strong, and working to elevate that and strengthen it within our building, um, our achievements were recognized at the Character uh, conference back in December and we are so grateful for the opportunity we had to go and listen to so many amazing amazing speakers at the breakout sessions which really is just throttling our plans for next year and how can we continue to use our launching points that we have in our curriculum to continue to develop that character work and that community both as a staff as students and as families What am I talking about? Real quick question. What was what oh, book our, did our you guys? Last year was a boy called Bass. Oh, the okay. And this year oh. we have. Use the mic. Like Sorry, I'm so used to not using a mic, I apologize. It was A Boy Called Bat last year, and what was really great it is a series. So there were three books in the series, and a lot of students uh, went to check out those books afterwards to keep reading and seeing what happened to our character. And this year we will be launching a book called Wish Tree, and we're really excited about that book. And that was um, selected with the help of Tara Jordan um, and... Um, one of our paraprofessionals, um, Samaya Sassi, helped to read the book and give us some feedback um, as it focuses around a Muslim family. So we're really excited about that. Great, thank you. How long is the grant for? The, the grant was just for last year. Um, and then this year, we um, are funding the book within our building. OK. I also have a question. When you say math facts, are we talking multiplication tables? So it is tiered. So for grade two, it is focused on addition and subtraction. And then it tiers up to multiplication, division, and also fractions. Joe, did you have a question? No, Any other questions? Sorry. Slides. Right. OK. Yeah, yes. no, I just wanted to catch the yeah. story while they were on it. Yeah. Um, I'm Sarah Tatero. I teach fifth grade at College Park. And um, this is a fun story because um, Monique Holth's sister was traveling in Thailand. And as she was traveling, she came upon another traveler. And they got to talking. And it turns out that this was a pretty famous Explorer. He has documentaries out. He's going to be on Netflix. Um, so they got to talking, and Monique's sister said, I'd love to set you up with my, my sister, who's a teacher, and she has kids that would probably really enjoy listening to you speak because he does engagements all around the world, uh, a lot of them virtually. So that's kind of how the uh, Explorer Mark Wood was brought to us. So it kind of shows you, like, you never know who you're going to meet whenever you go out. So, um, so he was gracious enough to meet with our kids. And he probably talked for a good 45 minutes. I, he could have probably talked a lot longer, and our kids could have listened a lot longer because what he had to say was so amazing. Um, we brought him in because it was a really good opportunity to relate it back to you know, we think of curriculum right away. What, what is this going to go with? And it was so apparent that it goes with so much of the things that we talk about every day at school. Um, right now for science, we're doing a water conservation unit. Um, there is a, um, an ecosystems restoration science unit coming up later on in the year. But as Mark Wood talked about his journeys and his adventures and his hardships, it was very clear that it was a lot of character strong components in what he was saying with perseverance and honesty, integrity, um, just being responsible. So it was very clear that there was lots of uh, character strong components to what he was saying, and most of all, like perseverance. So um, the kids had an opportunity to ask questions, and we got the questions to Mark. So when we did the video, uh, meeting with him he had the questions already written he had notes on his phone so he would ask you know who is Nathan and then we would take the computer over by him and he'd shake their hand and 
Um, he, was, he was really great with the kids. They asked really great questions, thoughtful questions. We had them look at his website that he has, um, that he's been creating. Um, and we were the last school and the last people he was going to be talking to until he came back 100 days from March 3rd. So he was going to start to enter his last part of his training um, because he is going to journey to the Arctic um, on a 100-day solo mission. Um, and he's going to be working with scientists from uh, Seattle, Washington. Um, he's going to be collecting ice samples. Um, and no person has ever been up there. Um, and no person has ever been alone that long on planet Earth. Uh, the world record is 70 days. So he's going for also a world record for 100 days alone. Wow. Um, he will not have any contact with anybody. So we were the last school he was willing to take on and talk to. Um, he's got podcasts posted. Um, so he's going to be trying to do podcasts if he can. He's also trying to test out technology and battery life in the extreme colds. So um, he's going to try to post podcasts that our kids are going to follow along with. Um, so March 3rd, he's going, and um, he is offered to come back. And he thought, you know, I don't know if it was in a spur of the moment thing, but he thought it would be really cool to come back and talk to the kids. We won't be here, though. But, um, you know, just starting to already think about, well, how could we make that work? Like, that would be really cool if he comes back and talks to us about what he did. And so he says, the last thing you're going to see of me is the Netflix documentary crew dropping me off 100 miles up in the Arctic and then me just standing there all by myself and that's the end of it. So it was just kind of a neat neat thing that he was talking to the kids about. They were engaged, enthralled. They were so like just amazed by all that he's done with his stories to Mount Everest and everything that he's done and what he's doing for the greater good um, to try to help our planet, to try to promote education about taking care of our planet. So he was just a really um, inspirational modern day explorer that we were fortunate enough to bring in and chat with him. Thank you. Thank you. The last thing we wanted to, to share is a, a picture of our uh, first grade team. And we say team because uh, our first grade teachers, the, the two teachers that are in first grade, uh, do a great job. But we took this picture because there's lots of other adults in this room. Uh, this does not happen in isolation. And the community that we, we are talking about building and, and really building collective efficacy throughout our building is supported by our EL teacher. And we have special ed case managers. And we have all these people who are in our classrooms helping our kids learn and grow. Um, and can you go to the next slide? Um, and really, when we're looking at how it positively impacts student achievement, um, if we look at the, the growth rates here on the, the left side, the, the green and the blue column are uh, students that are proficient and beyond. And we can see in the, the right graph there for our FastBridge, our most recent screener there, um, and for reading, um, we, we are just growing kids in that, that area of proficiency. Um, and and I, we just wanted to really share. Um, and I would be remiss to, to leave out that the Greendale Education Foundation for Reflex um, they have their grant funding cycles are very, they kind of specify them. And we were talking about, I think, in October, um, and their next cycle wasn't until February. And we wanted to, uh, you know, approach them for, for funding um, the licenses. And they went out of cycle. I mean, we, I, I submitted it, the application, and within like four or five days, they sent back saying they had their meeting and they approved it. So we were able to, to fund that. And then through some magic of uh, Maggie, she was able to fund it. And so all the elementary schools have access to Reflex, which is fantastic. So the last thing we wanted to, to leave you with was uh, you know, a, a quote from uh, David Truss. Um, and he, is, he says, teachers who collaborate learn from each other. They will feed off each other's insight and enthusiasm. And they will learn exponentially. If they participate in the collaborative learning opportunities with peers and students, they'll see exponential growth in student learning as well. Um, I think that at College Park, we, we the, 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 like was mentioned before, the, the open concept of the building just lends itself to collaboration and cooperation. Um, and principal pride is a real thing. I, I am so unbelievably honored and, and proud of the people that work in the building. 
Um, I really refer to myself as the, main, the, the lead support person. As principals, our job is to deal with everything so that our teachers are freed up to teach, and they do an amazing, amazing job. So thank you for your time this evening. Any questions? Thank you so much. Uh, board, any questions? Right. Go ahead. I don't have necessarily a question, but just a couple of things that um, piqued my interest or that I wanted to highlight. First of all, Mr. Brock, thank you for being here. Um, I think what we saw tonight, in my opinion, was that you know the greatest impact that on student achievement is the teacher that stands in front of them. Yeah. So, so thank you to the the group that was here today. I think that's evident with what's happening. A um, couple of things that I heard that I th I just wanted to highlight is um, using data uh, to make tweaks. You know, we we aren't we aren't afraid to shy or or we don't shy away from data to say you know what. We could do be better here, or you know what? There's an opportunity for us to improve here. Um, so I think we use that the right way. Um, school grades, reports, tests don't necessarily define the student, but it allows us to um, help the students uh, achieve to their full potential. So thank you for that. Um, heard about grants a couple of times, so I think that's awesome that you guys continue to try to find um, opportunities. Um, that we are outside the school district funding um, to, to help do that. So um, anyone that's listening or in the, else in the audience that wants to donate to the Greendale Education Foundation, there's information on our website uh, to do that because you see, you see the impact that, that happens to our students. So I think that's, that's great. Um, the other thing that I heard is how we, how we build on the social and emotional learning. You know, SEL, I think I heard a couple of times. And, and sometimes community members bristle at that. You know, oh, that's fluff. You get back to the basics, get to the read and write and arithmetic. Um, but when we build community, uh, our students do better. And when you look at some of the social and emotional learning that's happening, you can't argue with, let, let's nurture respect. Let's show what that, sh let's make sure that everyone knows what that looks like. Yes. Um, let's nurture honesty. You know, you can't argue with that. You know, that, that's something that um, we want to make sure that our students grow from. And, and let's nurture cooperation. You know, so I, I think the more that we talk about SEL and what's happening in our classrooms, um, the more our community has a chance to look at that and reflect and say, "Oh, okay, that 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 does make sense. That that we're investing in that." So those are my comments. Thank you again for all coming here. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? Comments? Thoughts? How, how long does the process last? Like when you start the new book, so it, was it the Wish Tree this year? Is this like. I apologize. Um, last year we had gone about eight weeks and we determined that that was a little too long for what we were doing. So this week we are, or this year, excuse me, we're aiming for about four weeks. So we've condensed it. The chapters are a little quicker than our last book. Um, and so it lent itself to go a little faster. Um, and we looked at the calendar just recently and I believe we're launching um, right after spring break and it lined up. Um, for an ending because the wish tree was aligned with May 1st. Thank you for trying to keep all my facts. And so it ends perfectly. And so we are kind of working through that. Maybe how could we get a tree that we could plant as a community and come together and hang our wishes that our students and our families and teachers have on it. So we have ideas that are still coming forth into fruition, but that is what we're hoping to have our culminating activity be for the book this year. Yeah, that sounds like a great activity. Yeah, we'll keep you posted. <laughs> I also wanted to. I, I mentioned uh, Greendale Education Foundation, but our PTO is amazing with funding pretty much anything we asked. When they came, when we looked at we, they had a book chosen, and then you know through discussion they chose a different book that was a little bit more. Um, but when I reached out to our PTO president and and talked with Danny Sun, you know I said, hey, we need this money and. I was working the half circle drive the next day and they came up and handed a check. So I mean they, they are so supportive and in helping us finance these things um, and, and it's another piece of our community. Nice. Anything else? I, I had a question. Um, you talked about this was the culture and climate committee that came up with this. I'd be curious as to other committees you have at the school. This one obviously is important. 
because uh, the culture and the climate of the school pretty much drives everything else and how it goes. And then a question about the books as well. Um, do, do every student or does every student get a copy or is it like if there's multiple kids in the family or is it every single student? They, they bought them brand new and they pack them in envelopes with the guides and they ship them off to every, every family gets a book. Every family uh, yeah. does, okay. One book per, per family, yes. Gotcha. And then we, have, we have other, when you're talking about other committees and, you know, we have a lot of committees that, you know, as, as Joe was mentioning, are like working, looking at data for academic pieces. Those are the, the really big ones um, for interventions. And uh, we have uh, PLCs where we're getting together to, to meet as grade level teams. Um, we go in and meet as a, a team when we're working on planning. Um, so there's a number of other committees, but you're absolutely right. Like culture and climate are the foundational piece of pretty much any institution, and and making sure that's a healthy culture and a healthy climate are paramount to success. So excellent. And I I was just going to comment. And obviously, just from the staff you brought here tonight, it takes a team of people working together. Uh, probably all of these committees that you have um, and and I want to thank your staff as well for the extra time and commitment to these different committees because that goes above and beyond just the we're teaching the academics every day they're looking at the whole picture and trying to create a, a, a culture like you said so thank you yeah, and Kathy thank you for acknowledging that because we encapsulated some of these things in three minutes and like to understand the depth and breadth of, of the work that has been put in above and beyond is, is hard to, to, to synthesize in such a short period of time. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone. We yeah. truly appreciate your time. Go ahead. Yeah, I just had one quick uh, question. Uh, first, obviously, thank you for sharing your learning journeys with us. Uh, but what's the story behind the shirts? Behind the... Those are College Park shirts. Oh, those are just the college. Okay. Is there a somebody does? Culture and climate. Like every year, we have a you, If you could use the mic, because we're streaming. All right. Sorry. sorry. So I'll keep your voices. I keep teacher. Voice. <laughs> yes. Um, every year we have a theme um, for all of us to come together, and this year it was let your light, you know, let your light shine through, um, be who you are, and we've since. Um, thinking about revamping how we handle our themes, but um, it's just another way that we come together each school year and figure out, you know, how do we send a message to the kids where that we're, we're all connected, this is what we want to work on, this is what we, what we want to focus on, this is who we are. Um, but yeah, every year we do, we do a shirt <laughs> and a new saying. Awesome. And the kids all have, each kid gets a shirt, um, each student gets a shirt as well. So every Monday we wear them. So it creates school spirit then. Is Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Good question. Awesome. Well, thank you all for taking your time in your evenings. I know that you've all had long days, and it's only a Monday, so uh, you can stay for the rest of our meeting if you'd like to hear some interesting things, or otherwise I'm sure you want to get home to your families. Yeah, um, let's give them a hand. Yeah, we had a number of people that just said, there's food in the fridge. Figure it out. So <laughs> we got to go make sure that worked out. So. Exactly. Well, let's give them a hand. Thank you, thank College you, everybody. Park. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, we are um, going to move on to communications. Dr. Midzik, do you have any communications tonight? I do. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that there was an incident that took place a couple weeks ago um, that has been shared by some on social media and at the board meeting and citizen comment. Greendale Schools does not accept nor tolerate the behavior that was displayed. We have investigated and issued consequences consistent with our school policy. Our responsibility to student confidentiality keeps us from providing specifics on student discipline. We know that you understand the importance of this duty. Our pupil services team has been supporting the students known to be most closely impacted and worked with some students to reteach appropriate school and online behavior. If your student was impacted and needs support, please contact the school office. We are planning a lesson to reteach safe and respectful behavior on social media. We ask parents and guardians also to monitor your children's social media use and talk to your children about your expectations for them online. The first of three operational referendum listening sessions was held on January 31st. There are two more opportunities for the community to learn more about the operational referendum, the tax impact if approved, and the overall financial outlook for the district. Sessions are set for Thursday, February 29th, and Wednesday, March 13th. 
Both sessions will be held in the Greendale High School Multipurpose Room, or cafeteria, from 6.30 p.m. to 8 p.m. The event on February 29th will be structured in a Q&A tabletop format. The dinner service for Senior Night at the Theater 2024 is sold out. For those interested in attending the show that evening, you can purchase a general admission ticket at the door beginning at 6 p.m. on March 14th. Tickets for the regular performances of Legally Blonde will go on sale February 18th online, and those dates are posted on the website. The 2024 report to the community is complete and delivery uh, delivered through the mail to Greendale residents is underway. Uh, the report includes achievement and benchmarking information, budget and financial details, district news, and celebrations. The 2024 edition also features information on the operational referendum. The Time for Learning Priority Registration opens Wednesday, February 14th and runs through Tuesday, February 27th. Registration takes place online on Infinite Campus. Families are in asked to indicate a pref preferred session, morning or afternoon, on their child's registration. A lottery system will determine the order in which placement requests will be considered. After February 27th, families may still register. However, the opportunity to request the AM or PM session may be limited. Complete registration information is posted on the Time for Learning website. Join us at, the Can at Canterbury on February 20th from 5.30 to 8 p.m. for a Community Connections Celebration of Black History Month. This free family fun special event will feature a performance by the Milwaukee Lutheran High School Gospel Choir, an urban chess pop-up opportunity, a dance exhibition and lesson by the Milwaukee College Prep Lloyd Street Step Team, plus a free craft project. Food, beverages, and boutique items will be for sale by Milwaukee area black-owned businesses. On Wednesday, February 21st, Greendale Schools and Community Alliance are co-sponsoring the annual family wellness event at Greendale High School. Poster presentations by the 8th grade Healthy Choices classes will be displayed from 5.30 to 6.45 p.m. in the library. Area wellness-related vendors will offer resource tables at that time. Uh, beginning at 7 p.m., Rachel Sawyer from NAMI South East Wisconsin will discuss what your kids wish you knew, a presentation in the high school cafeteria. Please join us for all or part of the event. And that concludes my communications. Thank you, Dr. Midzik. And our student board members, as we said earlier, are excused. I um, believe they're both in the music program right now. I'm going to move on to citizen comments. I just have a little statement I'll share. Uh, welcome to all those who will be speaking this evening. We would like to remind you that the school board meetings are for the purpose of carrying on the business of the district. They are official business meetings held in public. Through school board bylaw 0167.3, the board allows citizens to make comments by scheduling two opportunities on the agenda to receive citizen comments. In accordance with the intent of the open meetings law, Please be aware that although the Board of Education welcomes comments from the public, it cannot discuss or debate items brought up during public comments. In order to hear from all citizens who wish to speak and to ensure the official business of the district is addressed, board policy sets a time limit for citizen comments. We will be adhering to that board by law and its time limits at tonight's meeting. Persons wishing to address the board are asked to state, come to the podium, state their name and address for the record. Comments are limited to only one time. Individuals who will be speaking will be limited to three minutes, and citizen comments are limited to a period not to exceed 30 minutes. Thank you. So I would like to welcome up any speakers tonight. Good evening. Hi. Judith Wishman, 5771 Oakwood Street. On June 23rd of 2009, Governor Jim Doyle signed Executive Order 285 relating to furloughing state employees in response to the emergency economic situation facing Wisconsin. It required employees of state agencies and the University of Wisconsin system, including faculty and academic staff, to take unpaid leave furlough days during each fiscal year of the 2009 to 2011 fiscal biennium. Fast forward to 2024. I understand the Greendale School District has budget problems and is going to referendum on April 2nd to exceed the revenue limit and tax 2.5 million per year for five years 
$12.5 million total for operating costs. Let me suggest you consider Governor Doyle's approach if the referendum fails. James A. York stated, quote, the most successful people are those who are good at plan B, end of quote. I was employed at the university during this era. Were employees happy when they got wind of the furlough plan? Some yes, some no. Was there a mass exodus of employees? Not that I remember. Students were served, they were recruited, admitted, counseled, and advised. Transfer work was evaluated. Classes were held, students were taught, kids graduated. I spent the majority of my career working with minority and educationally disadvantaged students. I care about kids. A plan such as Doyle's were, would primarily affect administration and staff while minimizing negative input on the children. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else interested? Good evening. Hi, my name is Kristen Settle. I live at 8880 Green Hill Lane, and I am here tonight as a very proud varsity cheerleader mom. The varsity cheerleaders are headed down to Florida this week to participate in nationals. They are competing for the national title in both their traditional routine and in a routine called Game Day Live, which they do in partnership with the pep band. And Nick Galusha will be there with us, which is very exciting. Um, so I'm here to let everyone know that there are two opportunities to go and support the cheerleaders this week while we, while we are in Florida. Um, the first is on Wednesday at 7 p.m. here at the high school in the main gym. We're going to be doing a Game Day Live performance with the pep band um, as a send-off. And then Saturday night, February 10th, Explorium Brew Pub um, in Southridge will be hosting a watch party for the varsity performance, which takes place at 537, cen uh, yeah, 537 Central Time. Um, reservations are strongly recommended if you're going to come to Explorium, but this will be a great opportunity to come and watch the cheerleaders. Um, and I just want to say thanks to Mike and Joan Doble for um, allowing this to happen. And um, anybody who can't travel down to Florida can, can watch the cheerleaders. So go Greendale. Thank you. Good evening. Hi, um, Elise Siski, 5679 Oriel Court. Um, first, go Greendale. Second, um, I'm a College Park parent. I have a second grader. College Park is fantastic. Um, I'll have a kindergartner, which is terrifying and sad, um, next year. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and second of all, I'm here to remind everyone that in-person absentee voting starts tomorrow for primary. Um, you can vote at the Village Hall between 8 and 4 p.m. Monday through Friday until February 16th, and then the primary election is February 20th. Um, I, myself, will be absentee voting this week, so maybe I'll see any of anyone listening um, there um, because I'll be busy engaging, educating, and empowering women in the auto care industry in beautiful Salt Lake City for work the week of the primary, unfortunately, but um, or fortunately because it's a great event. But um, be sure to check out the second oval on the ballot. I heard that that woman is extraordinary. So thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak tonight? Good evening. Good evening, Brian Bach, uh, 6008 Clover Lane. Um, I just wanted to make a couple notes. First, I know we do a lot of recognition for a lot of the sports, but also I'd like to say congrats to the GMS forensics team. Hearing they got second over the weekend was pretty awesome. Especially when I thought of forensics initially, I was thinking like crime scene analysis. <laughs> and they had to re-educate me a little bit with my daughter's friends, so that was fun to learn. Um, and then I'd also like to congratulate the PR team for Canterbury, or I should say the school district in general, um, just passing on some of the information that's been going on in the district. I've seen a lot more of that coming out recently um, from the forensics team to just events like the Mark Wood event, which I would like to say, I think, I don't know, I like to hear from him when he's coming back. I think that'd be pretty awesome for a community event too, um, just in general. So I'd be with the kids to see and talk to him again. Um, but then also the last thing, just tomorrow night, there is a Canterbury PTO referendum informational session at 6 p.m. in the Canterbury Library. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else interested in speaking? We will have a second opportunity later in the meeting. 
If not, we're going to move on with our agenda. Um, we have two items that we have to approve tonight, but we are going to need to amend both of them. The closed session meeting minutes of January 22nd, item 1.1. Um, there was an error in the minutes. Um, Jonathan Mitchell and Julie Grodeforce were not uh, present, so we need to have an amendment to remove their names. And then for item 1.2, um, Julie Grodeforce was also excused for the regular meeting minutes, uh, so, or regular meeting. So I'll be looking, uh, we can probably take this as one just with both parts. So would somebody be willing to make a motion to amend? Sure, I will motion to amend items one, first of all, item 1.1 to exclude Jonathan Mitchell and Judy, Julie Grotopos from the minutes since they did not attend. And also in item 1.2 to uh, remove Julie Grotopos because um, she was excused from that meeting. Second. So we do have a motion and a second to amend. The meeting minutes from 1.1 and 1.2, the closed session meeting minutes, and the regular meeting minutes from January 22nd. Any discussion on that? If not, we'll take a roll call, please. Yes. 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 And I'm yes, motion carries. And then do we have to motion again to? We amended, so we do need to. Okay, so I amended motion. Amended motion. Thank you. Um, so if I could look for a motion to um, approve the amended minutes. I move, move to approve the amended minutes for the closed session and action item 1.1 on January 22nd, 2024, as well as the amended um, action item 1.2 for approval of the regular meeting minutes of January 22nd. Second. So we do have a motion and a second to approve the amended meeting minutes in items 1.1 and 1.2 from January 22nd. Any discussion on either of those? If not, we'll take a roll call, please. Yes. 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 And I'm yes, motion carries. We're moving on to our new business. We are set to uh, take action on personnel. We've got a teacher resignation. Um, and a teacher retirement request. Uh, Dr. Midzik, anything you would like to add with either of those? Uh, no, I recommend that you approve both of them. They have both um, provided excellent service and are ready to um, move on. Move on. Move on. <laughs> yes. Any other discussion or questions at all? I will just simply say with the retirement, I did have the privilege of working with Sandy Spear and want to just say thank you to her many years of service to Greendale School. She has done some phenomenal things over at Greendale Middle School. Um, so anyone else? If not, I'll be looking for a motion to approve the action items as outlined in 4.1. I move approval of personnel as outlined in item agenda item 4.1 to approve the teacher retirement request and to approve the teacher resignation request. I'll second. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. So we do have a motion and a second to approve item 4.1, which is action on personnel, approval of a teacher retirement, as well as approval of the teacher resignation. Any further discussion on either of those? Seeing none, we'll take a roll call, please. Yes. 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 And I'm yes. Motion carries. We're moving right on to our new business tonight, which is uh, starting with 5.1. It's our second trimester district scorecard review. And Dr. Midzik, I'll turn it over to you. Yes. So what you have linked in the board packet is the overall scorecard goals. And our um, effort is to ensure that every trimester, so three times a year, you receive an update on the activities and the actions that we are taking to advance the goals within the scorecard. Um, I'm going to share uh, the business services goal as every administrator is responsible and what you're seeing is district um, sharing one publicly and then if you have questions about the others everyone is uh, available to ask. Mr. Mitchell is ill this evening so that's why I'm presenting his. Um, his goal area was to uh, um, around the goal of developing a strategy to be fiscally sustainable with current level of student programming for the 24-25 school year. 
uh, and in order to do this, uh, the first trimester, if you'll recall, was identifying methods uh, and presenting them to the board for decision. And with the approval of the resolution to go to operational referendum, the second short cycle, uh, his activities were to provide accurate uh, information in to the community of, of regarding the operational referendum. To date, there have been 18 uh, different presentations out in the community, so those extend beyond those opportunities where we invite people in, uh, which happened on January 31st uh, and will happen again on February 29th and March 13th. But there have been 18 times where Mr. Mitchell or myself or other members of the team, I think Maggie is presenting tomorrow night at Canterbury, um, are sharing uh, accurate information on aspects of uh, the operational referendum resolution that was approved by the board. Uh, and we have sent two uh, direct mailers to homes in the village, one with the village views and one with the report to the community that was delivered over the weekend. So, uh, and every time Mr. Mitchell presents, every time I present, we have questions from community members that help uh, shape information that we provide so that we know what information is missing uh, to help voters make an informed choice. Uh, alongside that, uh, we are actively working to uh, um, identify potential uh, program reductions and um, budget reductions that um, we can consider. And I know there was one offered in citizen comment tonight. So we're continuing to identify those alongside um, providing accurate information to the community. So that's an example of one of the short cycles. If you had a chance to go through the board packet and there's specific ones that you'd like to ask about, I can handle information technology and everyone else is here. Awesome. All right, so do we have any questions or um, thoughts on any of the other, or this one as well, the cycle reports tonight? Anyone? Uh, well, I just had another comment on the communications for the operational referendum. I know that, that it's a Rachel, that's coming on Thursday for the parent-teacher advisory group at the middle school that we're starting. So I'm I'm a member of that now. So that'll be another good um, option. And then I was wondering too. Um, we always have the senior night at the theater, and so I thought maybe that might be a good place to distribute information um, re in regards to the referendum. Thank you. We'll idea. certainly um, add that to our list. Okay. Thanks. Excellent idea. And yeah, I, yeah, I have a question for Ms. Ledesma. If she, we've had a couple uh, questions have popped up about mental health services in the schools. And so you're in charge of pupil services, and that includes the special education department and the support service staff. Could you just talk a little bit about, you know, who you're overseeing and then what mental health supports we have in our buildings? Absolutely. So I oversee the pupil services programming here in the district. So that would be our mental health professionals, school mental health professionals, school psychologists, school social workers, school counselors. Um, and our scorecard kind of speaks to a little bit our mental health framework here in the district. It really starts with that mental health promotion and supporting the well-being of our students. Some of the things that we heard highlighted this afternoon by College Park. So things related to school climate, like PBIS, like character strong, sources of strength, our um, universal curriculum character strong, that would be the first layer of support that we have for our students. I would add to that um, the SABRE screening, which we just wrapped up our universal screening window on. All of those things together make up our mental health framework, how we ensure that our students have a place of belonging here in Greendale schools, that they're being cared for um, mentally, socially, emotionally, and academically here in the district. So that would be like our main focus around promotion, those tier one supports. We do have other elements. If we identify students that might need a higher level of support, we have mental health professionals that can provide interventions for them. That's always going to be based on data and kind of us using our systems to identify those students that may need additional support. And those and additional supports are always provided with consent from parents. That's sure. the point. And, yeah, and how many um, school social workers, school psychologists, and school um, counselors 
are in each building. Yeah, I think that's a point of pie for us here in Greendale that we have school mental health professionals in all of our schools. We have five school psychologists, so one at each school. We have one middle school counselor, three high school counselors, and then three social workers here in the district. Okay, thank Great you. Questions. Anything else? Uh, well, also, when, when will the results um, be shared from the Sabres? Um, my mic went survey. off. I'm getting my mic back on. That's a great um, question. So like I said, our window just closed on January the 31st. We are actually meeting as a mental health academy. So that's made up of our mental health professionals, school psychologists, social workers, and counselors. Tomorrow um, will be our first meeting following the SABRE screening. And what we do there is we hold what we call a data analysis team. And we work through a series of questions to really analyze the data that we have for SABRES. This is our first formal um, screening cycle. So we will be going through that process and then producing summaries for every school, which we'll share out with the staff around our findings related to SABRES. Excellent. Uh, any other questions? I, I did have one for Kitty, if she doesn't mind, and also for Julie. Um, just in both of your reports, thank you, first of all. Um, I'll start with Kitty. Um, I noticed with your report you were working on the, um, the media outlets um, such as LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and X, which is the old Twitter, right? Yes. Um, so I just wanted to get a feel for uh, what kind of um, feedback logistics are we getting back from these sites? Are we, like, is there any one of these that's he more heavily um, looked at by the public or, you know, LinkedIn is obviously important for networking. Um, for staff, and I know you were trying to work that through as far as uh, staffing for the district. So we are maybe seeing, speak to that. I'm sorry, we are seeing some great increase in our engagement on LinkedIn. Okay. I don't have the data right in front of me, but I can supply that to you That'd through the great. DU. But we are seeing like 140% increase. Now, when you start from zero, 140% increase isn't so hard to get. Right. You people look at it, and, and we get some likes and posts. We post once a week on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, we post on the other media that we, the other media, social media platforms, two to three times a week. In fact, I'm Instagramming right now. Ah. So um, we post things on Instagram. Instagram tends to be a younger demographic of people who are following us. Um, so we get a lot, of a lot of likes and shares in stories from high schoolers who are who are also on that social media platform. Again, I don't have that data right in front of me, but we are seeing more engagement on Instagram, just anecdotally, than we are seeing on Facebook or even on X. X, we, we in school PR are trying to figure out what is our future on X, although we do have many members of our community who only follow us on that platform. Um, and I know who they are, and mm -hmm. so I'm, I don't want to step away from that platform sure. because there is a place for that. Um, and also, you know, when there's a, a day off of school because of severe weather, that's one of our main ways that we can get that information out quickly, and we can share that with the news media that way. Okay. I still go back and make those calls, but I can link to all the news media or tag them, and that gets that information out a little bit faster. And thank you. That was very helpful. And then a second part to that was I know you're doing the Why I Teach um, series. I, I, I don't am. know if it's a series, but there, how many have there been now? There's been. Uh, we have few. produced those videos three years. This will be the fourth year. Fourth year. We and took a hiatus during the pandemic, and now we were back two years ago. So, so is that something that you're also able to, uh, and maybe you are doing this, I just haven't seen it. Um, put on LinkedIn, for instance, like so people are seeing? We will definitely when the new ones are produced. And we actually have a playlist on YouTube that shares all of the About Our District videos. So those are okay. where, that's where I post the um, Cultivating Excellence in Every Student video. The videos about the different teachers that I've produced over the years, those are also post under there and I posted under there and I have shared that particular playlist out on YouTube. And then as the new the new videos are produced, I will go through and actually share that particular video onto that channel. So people can get to know a little bit about our educators um, personally and as much as you can in 90 seconds and, and learn about their style of teaching and what they bring the commitment to students. Okay, great, thank okay. you. Anyone else while she's up there, I don't wanna put her on the spot. <laughs> 
Thank you, Kitty. I'll let sure. you get back to your Instagramming. Um, and then, Julie, this kind of dovetails right over to you um, because we're doing surveying. I, I was trying to think of the name for it, but you are doing like a baseline um, net promoter for Greendale schools. Can you just speak to that a little bit and what kind of feedback? I know you're not at the final point because that's the third trimester, but how is, uh, how is that working as far as the uh, feedback we're getting from staff from Greendale? Are they satisfied or what are you learning? Yeah, so I've been meeting individually with staff that are identified for state interviews and um, gathering feedback for suggestions for improvements, um, their experiences in the buildings, and we're trying to get a representative number of staff from each of the buildings. So those interviews have started. Um, the staff that we're meeting with have been providing really valuable, um, helpful feedback and really looking to them for suggestions and what is it that keeps you wanting to work in Greendale schools. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah, well, I'll piggyback on uh, the uh, asking Julia a few questions. Um, could you, I, I mean, I, we all know at the table, but it probably bears worth repeating, especially this time of year, that there's a shortage of teachers, there's a shortage of administrators, there's a shortage of support staff, there's a shortage of special ed teachers. Is there any um, hope on the horizon in terms of that? Are we... Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're tracking that closer than most people. And then secondly, uh, your goal to en ensure that we're retaining uh, high quality staff by creating a desirable workspace. If you could, you know, expand on what you mean by desirable. Well, that's part of the feedback that we're gathering through the state interviews from staff of what is it that keeps them engaged and keeps them wanting to work here. Um, when we talk with staff, we do exit interviews as well, but we're really trying to be proactive in the state interviews and identify staff that are currently working here and what is it that keeps them here. So um, focusing on those, those factors that they identify through the state interview process. Um, also just through more informal feedback. Um, I do building hours a couple times a year where I'm out meeting with staff and talking with them um, and understanding what issues are at the forefront and what they're concerned about, what questions that they have at, at that time and what we can be more proactive working with Kitty through our notebook communications and addressing issues as they arise. Um, in terms of the supply demand issues um, that we are facing, I have the opportunity as a member of the Wisconsin Association of School Personnel Administrators um, to really work in the advocacy portion of that, looking at the teacher shortage and and what are some, um, again, more proactive approaches that we can take to, we have our Educators Rising Club, um, to attract students into the profession, um, as well as working with the universities, trying to diversify the pipeline of teachers that are entering the profession. Um, so really looking at those longer term um, goals. We've worked with the Department of Workforce Development around apprenticeship programs and the possibility of training additional teachers um, through that program and giving them experiences directly in our schools. Um, so lots of different in initiatives happening trying to target different areas and different ways to attract people. But is it is it looking, I mean, what is it, is it are, we, are we making any strides in terms of those pipelines or is it looking still pretty bleak for the next season of hiring coming up here? So for Greendale schools, we're fortunate in that we are a desirable district for both teachers. Um, our teacher salary structure is one of the things that's attractive to staff that are, as they're considering. Um, but we have definitely seen a decrease in the number of applicants overall um, when we do post positions. And so part of that is uh, attending recruitment fairs and being out early and um, promoting the district and you know sharing all the things that Kitty's sharing via social media that show why it's a desirable place to be. Okay, and obviously salary is one of the things that's desirable, but what would you say is number two or three on the list of why people... I wouldn't even say salary is at the top of the list. It's one of the factors, but when you look at retention data, it is often the relationship that they have with their coworkers, the relationship that they have with their supervisors, the work culture, the environment that they have in the school, and that there's a lot of you know, professional hours is another thing that frequently comes up from our staff, that they have that flexibility and respect as a professional in our district. Okay, thank that you. Was part of your report was about the work-life balance, right? Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned the educators rising. Um, do how much? Uh, how many students are coming back to us? That's been going on for probably at least seven years now. Five uh, yeah. years. 
Yeah, something. Um, we started it in 2017 was our first group of students. Um, we have not hired any students back, but we do provide them with the Pledge to Prosper and the um, guarantee of an interview to return. Um, did have some conversation with someone who had graduated looking at positions for this year, and she ended up going to a different district, but having that op op opportunity and conversation with, with our grads. Good. All right. Go ahead, Joel. Um, you know, I think I heard it earlier mention, you know, that we're going to be um, capturing some net promoter scores um, as a baseline now uh, recently so that we can kind of grow from there. I think that's great. I think the net promoter score is an industry-wide um, measurement. You, you know, do you recommend working here or, or don't you? And I think what you hear in, in the, the corporate world is that good people know good people. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, to, to ma marry that with what's happening with the communications, um, that, that's, that's, a, a, that's a good fit because um, we want staff to, to be a promoter of the district, but we also want them to help in the recruiting. Um, so by developing that video that says, why do I teach? Why do I teach in Greendale schools? Um, it all works together. So um, thank you for addressing that. And I just want to thank everyone for the reports. This is always a helpful for us to kind of keep pulse on how, how all of your goals are going and, and how the district's proceeding. So thank you. Anyone else before we move on? All right. We will move on to our policies. We had a number of policies. This is our first reading. Weren't too many changes, right? These were just updates to the NEOLA, Dr. Midzik? There are three policies that the... Uh, Sorry, uh, there are three policies that the uh, um, that were that where there is potential uh, content or intention changes. The ones that are recommended by Neola are refinements based on legal challenges or uh, changes in uh, policy or law that would guide those, and so. Hopefully you had a chance to look through those independently, but the three that you may want to have a conversation about is uh, policy 175.1 school board conferences. There is uh, consideration through the policy committee to uh, change the approval process for out-of-state conferences, conventions, or workshops, and um, to consider adding uh, criteria by which you consider out-of-state travel to include um, board members within the six months of the end of their current school board term would um, not be approved for out-of-state conferences and travel. So that's the first one that you might want to consider. The second one is 2240, controversial issues in the classroom. Uh, and in this one, there is a change to teachers sharing their opinion on controversial topics. And the third one is 5540, relations with government relationship with governmental agencies there is a change around um, what happens when a student who is being interviewed by a police officer, uh, what happens when they request legal counsel. So those three had um, substantive changes uh, that you may want to have a conversation about. The others are legal changes. So my thought is we'll just uh, touch on each one, make sure everyone's good um, or have any questions. We'll start with the 0175.1, the school board conferences, conventions, and workshops. Um, as Dr. Midzik said, that was um, set to change two items, and they're actually also um, putting the responsibility onto the entire board to vote on these in the future rather than just placing it on the board president. So any thoughts or discussion on that? Tonight. I would just uh, encourage the board to to um, consider, you know, the third line of this policy says that attendance at regional, county, state, and national workshops and conferences is encouraged. So um, I can understand why the policy committee wanted to limit uh, travel during someone's final term, but I think that we should uh, clarify that. Um, unless there's no one else that's willing to go, you know, to to not send anyone at all, um, I think is is you know doesn't doesn't meet the policy um, the guidelines of the policy either. So 
Um, so I think maybe a, a C, letter C in there. Um, you know, it already says no more than two board members may attend. Uh, and it says board members who have not attended should have preference. And then C would, you know, be some sort of wording regarding, um, you know, if you're in your the last year of your term or the last six months or whatever the suggested wording is, fine. But then add unless there's no other board members willing to go, because to send no one, um, I think is is a little concerning. Thoughts on that board? My thing was with the not sending anyone was just because we're going to a referendum. That was. And then uh, along that lines, then maybe we add then the policy, the professional development um, money, which is $3,500, I believe, this year. That's this year's budget. So that was this year's budget. So then that money, instead of being used for professional development, should be dispersed in some other way. I mean, it wasn't money from next year's operational budget that I, we were talking about. I'll defer to Dr. Midzik, but my understanding is that is something that the electorate voted on, and we cannot just change where that money is dispersed. That was at our annual meeting, Dr. Midzik. Uh, the community voted on two, uh, um, two items one was uh, board salary and they set the salary amount and the second thing that they voted on was to reimburse actual expenses so um, they did not set the amount of money to reimburse actual expenses but they did approve and authorize board members to be reimbursed for actual exp actual expenses for travel related to board business and i think just just to add to that in typically in at the end of the fiscal year like the may june time frame there is a a budget amendment vote that says there's unused funds in these funds let's shift that money to these other budget accounts mm, you like you do approve um moving but, money around and then unspent money is uh, returned to fund balance yeah, I, I mean, we wish Jonathan was here because he would be able to answer it better. But I remember distinctly that we voted at the annual meeting, the electorate had voted to increase the amount of professional development um, that was allowed, you know. I, I, I remember the part about actual expenses, but then there's also sort of an estimated budget amount for professional development, which was at le uh, approximately $3,500. So there's two so. things there, the way I understand it, is that one, the community votes solely, as Dr. Mizik said, solely on authorizing school board reimbursement or travel or other related expenses. So that's all they're, they're providing um, direction on. The dollar amount is part of the overall budget. So right. Within that overall budget, there there was a dollar amount. I, I can't quote and, what it was. And we voted to increase it. I mean, it was it was voted uh, to be increased to a certain amount, which is makes it just a little bit. I mean, to to Rob's point, if 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 you want to make a condition on referendums, then you would in that second line would say each board member is expected to report. Excuse me, third line board members may attend out of state. Oops, sorry. Second line, attendance at regional, county, state, and national workshops and conferences is encouraged except if there is a referendum on the ballot. Because that's what I, I hear Where you? Rob saying, that, that he, the, the issue with this particular conference, the money had nothing to do with the operational referendum. Where it, was, it was this year's budget, but if that's how, this board feels that nobody should be going, um, it's encouraged except if there's a referendum, then you know, we could certainly add that language. Where are you seeing the policy? I'm uh, it's policy 175.1 um, in board docs. So the second line, I just went right to the policy. If it's, is it linked in the agenda too? I don't think. No. That I don't yeah, I didn't see it in the that agenda. Is the only, that's the only one that's not linked. It's just identified. Yeah. 
So, I mean, um, I, I just think that it was the, to link it to the referendum, that would be like saying, well, nobody should be traveling this year because there's an upcoming referendum. Well, maybe that's the case. Maybe nobody should be going to Florida or anywhere else because we have a referendum coming up. I thought when we're dealing with this year's budget money, that's different than the budget for next year, which is the operational referendum. But if this board thinks that that's a legitimate uh, you know, criteria, then you would amend this policy to say that it's encouraged for board members to attend professional development, except if there's a referendum question on the ballot. I, I think the change that we're talking about making, um, putting it for a discussion by the board, I think is the best approach to it because that, we can discuss that, that. Then we would discuss that, and as a board, you know, either concur or not. Well, I, that would tie into too if a candidate or a school board member doesn't have a somebody running against them, then we can have a yes. discussion at the board table, like, "Oh, Mary, no one's running against you. You're within the six months, but you can go because you'll be back on the board." So I think it kind of falls into board discussion. Yeah, I, I mean, I am all for the board discussing it. Um, I think we need to be careful telling each other when and where we should go, because if we're going to be approving that for out of, out of state travel, then maybe we should be s discussing every single professional development um, you know, workshop that people sign up for. And, I, and actually, this kind of ties into agenda item for me. This ties into agenda item uh, 5.4, um, which I, I would propose that this board, s since there was some issue res re around this year's out-of-state travel, I would propose that this school board look at that $3,500 approximately, what's in professional development, divide it by five, add that money to a stipend, and then let each school board member go on their own professional development learning journeys. I would not even be supportive of that. Yeah, so my, even I'm gonna play off the comment from earlier. I would say that this is us taking a furlough and not using the, um, the money to go on a trip based off the economic conditions that we're in. Okay. Well, I th then that should be added into the policy. Uh, but I think th I think this falls under board discussion. Well, it, I it's too specific, and I, I mean there can be a lot of things that will come up, and I think that. So I'm hearing three things for policy purposes, um, and the others are for future budget considerations. So the board is amenable to the change to. Uh, um, change it to seminar subject to the following guidelines and approval of the board as a whole, not the board president, and potentially adding two things. One, board members in the last six months of their term should refrain from out-of-state travel. And two, if there is a budget deficit in a given year, out-of-state travel may be restricted. Maybe, I'm sorry, could you say that? Maybe may be restricted. restricted. Are those amenable? I'm... Could just got access to this policy for revision so that I'm not editing the live um, current policy online. And so I am taking notes on your discussion. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds Thoughts good. That? I, I, that's a good, I think that's a good summary. Sound good to everyone? So switch it to may be restricted? May be restricted, yeah. And again, I, I do you know concur with uh, Rob. I think, I think we do need to be having these kinds of board discussions and you know, it did put something on me this last time that I didn't really want to be the only one making the decision on. I even talked about switching it up and having us all have that discussion. But um, I well, and you can approve your own trips too. Right. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, um, so it's I think just a better way to communicate too, because I mean, it's just kind of through like district updates that you know the questions ask. It's not ever really done at the table. So I think this is like a better overall. We can decide who's going and not. Mm -hmm. Well, and although I do think this board should at least reflect on the possibility of not running every single um, professional development opportunity um, through the board table and discussion, because as we heard in our last meeting, there are um, there's not you know boards don't always get get along. People have run against each other, 
and there can sometimes be some uh, personal issues that come up then uh, in determining whether someone can attend a professional development workshop or not. So I thought this was just for national this is travel. Just national, we're talking about yes. The way the policy is worded, this applies to out-of-state travel, not in-state travel. That's good. Okay. So other than that, anything else anyone see uh, with that policy, uh, one uh, bylaw one seven five point one. Right. Again, this is a first reading, so if you have any further thoughts, um, I do encourage, I, I know there are other districts, I believe Muskego is one of them, they do have policy um, written in such a way that has some of this language about um, some restrictions on this kind of travel um, for the same reasons. Um, all right, so moving on to the uh, policy 2240, is that right? Is that controversial issues? Dr. Mizik, anything you'd like to share there? That policy is linked for you to see the recommended revisions from the policy committee. So under section E, your, uh, the policy committee is suggesting striking number four, expresses Correct. opinions, but informs students it is their opinion and not their the authoritative answer. So the policy committee is suggesting that teachers do not express their opinion on a controversial issue. Is that correct? That is being stricken from the area that says the student shall have the right to. Um, and so we are striking that they don't necessarily have a right to a teacher who expresses their opinion. And so that is why it's stricken. Uh, there's additional guidance down below uh, under letter I that says the classroom teacher is obligated to approach controversial issues and in this one says label any personal expression as personal opinion and refrain from sharing personal beliefs regarding controversial issues at the elementary level. At the secondary level, teachers may share a personal opinion only if asked by the students and only after all student discussion on the matter has concluded. I, I don't see that part, that's towards letter the I. It's on, it's oh, on page I. two, letter I. Okay, I was way up at the front. So yep. is four There's is two spots. four being that's being stricken? Correct. Okay. And then um, I under the teacher responsibilities is revised. Okay. All right. And we already stated this was uh, policy twenty two forty controversial issues in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, are teachers still encouraged um, back in my day um, to? discuss upcoming controversial curriculum or lesson plans with their administrators? That remains in the policy, yes. Well, and I would, most of our curriculum is board approved. So mm -hmm. that is how we drive our decision making for our teachers. And so, and that is all available to the community on the website as well. So. If it is deemed controversial, we've talked about it at the board table and had those conversations and it's been approved um, by the board. Um, but if they are talking about like current issues or something yeah. that is coming up that is absolutely talking, spoken to with their um, principal and also me, the director of um, equity and instruction. Uh, so the policy reads, all issues discussed within the classroom will be relevant in terms of a pre-designated course content approved curriculum. Parents, students of the district shall have a right to complain to administration if they believe unfair and prejudiced classroom presentations are being made. And the teacher who is in doubt concerning the advisability of discussing certain issues in the classroom is expected to consult with the principal. So that is in current policy and there's no recommendation for revision. With this, um, does it, I'm just looking through, is there language about parents opting out if there is a controversial issue that's going to be discussed? I know um, there's some religious things, but can you speak to that? I have to reopen the policy to reopen. Well, the health curriculum is the most obvious. Right. And I that's a state law that parents are allowed to opt I mean, in the past, the students have gotten a note sent home through an email. About a controversial? Mm-hmm. And the option to I didn't not attend. I wasn't seeing it. I'm just wondering if there needs to be some language in there that parents. It's at the bottom. Is it at the bottom? To get it to the bottom. Yeah, bottom. Yeah, bottom. Yeah, bottom. Yeah, bottom. There it is. Okay. 
Yep. The last paragraph, uh, the entire last paragraph advises on parent objections to controversial topics. Okay. Okay, that's good. So any other, and this was obviously vetted as Thank well. Thank you, Rachel. What's that? Yeah, good call, good call. Yeah. yeah. She read faster than me to the end. <laughs> there were a lot of policies to look at this time. Um, so any, uh, any other thoughts on this one? Otherwise, I think, uh, again, we're set to vote on it at the next one. So if you have any other questions, um, Dr. Midzik, these, these are vetted uh, legal and so forth as well through NEOLA. So they probably have looked at other districts. NEOLA is very clear that they're not legal counsel. Not legal, yeah. <laughs> but there are attorneys that review policy uh, language. And so if there's something in question that is different than what NEOLA is recommending, then um, they advise that we talk with our own legal counsel. None of these uh, went against NEOLA's uh, vetted language. Uh, it was just a revision and different selection within their menu of options for how we handle them. Okay, and then our last one is uh, 5540, which is the schools and governmental agencies. Any thoughts or questions on that one? Or Dr. Midzik, if you have any comments. The language is in there. You can see the strike through and the bolded addition under A2. Okay. Any questions on that one at all? All right. Seeing none. All right, so we will come back to this at our next meeting. Uh, have any other questions, or if you need guidance, I'm sure Dr. Midzik can help out in the interim. Uh, we're moving on to 5.3. This is an interesting one to me, the Charter School Grant. Um, Dr. Midzik, you wanna touch base on this one for us tonight? Yes, so um, in Greendale, we are a district of destination. The board sets a goal to remain a district of choice for families um, and to be competitive in the marketplace. Uh, we have over 90% of our school age children choosing Greendale schools as their, um, their school for uh, the year, for choosing Greendale schools. Um, the other percentages uh, attend private schools. Um, open enroll into other public schools or uh, choose homeschooling. Uh, and as part of those priorities, we are looking to uh, figure out if there is something that we can do differently or a way that we can structure school differently that may attract and retain the less than 10% that are not currently choosing Greendale schools. Uh, the state of Wisconsin announced competitive grants uh, to fund charter school development uh, that is coming through federal funding. And uh, we have evaluated and are working towards um, writing a grant for planning. So what a planning grant means is that uh, you are applying for money to spend a year developing the concept into a viable operational school uh, concept. And then if you have a school plan that comes together, there is a second opportunity to apply for an implementation grant. So neither of the school um, concepts that are here would be implemented for the 24-25 school year. They would be for schools that would launch in the 25-26 school year. So we are looking at two possibilities. One is targeting a population that has, has historically chosen a homeschooling environment, um, and that is expanding on our partnership with the field workshop. We're looking at 20 to 20 to 50 students in grades kindergarten through fifth grade that would um, be interested in some sort of structure, uh, some sort of structured opportunity to engage socially uh, with other students in a homeschool environment and some guiding curriculum. So it might follow a Montessori model. It might follow um, some part-time on-site, some time off-site, uh, and the opportunity to experience things in the field, uh, field trips um, with peers, et cetera. So we are working on essentially developing an instructional program that would um, be an opportunity for homeschool students to engage differently in their learning. 
And then the second consideration is an online charter, uh, an online virtual charter that would serve students in grades 6 through 12. We'd be looking to begin with somewhere between 20 and 50 students uh, and explore that. And that would be in partnership with an established online curriculum resource with contracted teachers through the online platform. Uh, so not a not not what it looks like where they're online and there's no teacher on the other side, but that they would be teacher supported online modules that we would um, use that have been established. Uh, and some in alignment with university curriculum. So there are a number of universities who have high school-based um, curriculum opportunities that we would be exploring and considering. So the the grant would be under $100,000, and therefore an administration will be able to make that application by board policy. Um, we are working to finalize some grant requests with those funding. Um, what those funds would be used for would be to compensate uh, staff or others who are working on developing the concept of the school could be uh, used for purchasing some curricular resources, uh, could be used for making visits to existing schools that have similar concepts in other areas of the state. So funding some travel for a small team to explore other schools that have similar conceptual design. We are not looking to establish another traditional environment. We are looking to establish something that is uh, different and e unique and serves a population that is currently not served in our traditional school environments. Questions? So thank, thank you for that explanation. I, I've got a couple of questions. This is for um, planning or understanding what it looks like. Correct. If we don't get the grant, because it's a competitive grant, right? If we don't get the grant, would we still go forward with the planning and how, how, what would the impact be there? The impact would be that we might not have the ability to travel and visit schools. Um, it might be that we have less capacity, uh, staff capacity, to go out and engage in some of the planning work because the time uh, there's not sufficient compensated time to be able to do that work. So we would attempt to do it, but on a smaller scale, and it may or may not have the level of um, vetted experiential opportunities to go out and take a look at that. There are, for both of these concepts, there's known um, charters not in the state that are um, there, and so we would have to do virtual, but not be able to see them in operation or have some of the robust conversations. So there would be some limitations to the, the development process if we don't have the grant funding to support it. And, and just, I, I mean, well, I understand the timeline. So this, we're approving, or we will not, I'm sorry, we're not approving, you're informing us of yes. th this application for a grant. Um, there may be another grant that comes later. So, so, you know, as we progress, there might be another one that says, you know, we we want a grant that will help fund some of the implementation costs. Mm -hmm. we'll see I think we did that for the the time for learning the K four. Yes, we did. So, so there might be an opportunity where there's a second grant. So, so they're they're not Correct. the same, but they are related. So, um, we will absolutely be informing the board and the community uh, should we be successful in the grant. And either way, any kind of development that we're considering around a charter school um, concept would be shared with the board uh, with some reports. And should we apply for implementation funding, there would be a presentation to the board of what was accomplished with the planning grant or through the planning process. And um, the board would have to approve uh, the application for the implementation grant because it would likely be more than the one hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars that is set in board policy. And then would you? So, so now we're talking about the funding. And then would you see that if? Oh yes, you absolutely have to approve. Um, and right. you have to approve the charter, and then the charter for uh, a school that would open that is an instrumentality of the district would need board approval, and then it would need a separate board to um, oversee. So that's kind the of the school. timeline is that we, mm -hmm. we are taking action, or again, we're not taking action, <laughs> informing us about this grant associated with the planning. Mm -hmm. There may be another grant that more likely we'll have to vote on, the board will have to vote on because of the dollar amount to start implementing. 
and then there might be a third board review that says now take action on do you Correct. approve that. Um, and I think I heard you, but I want to ask just to make sure is that uh, there are different types of charters. One is where the district holds the instrumentality, and there's others where uh, another institution holds the instrumentality. These that we're looking at right, as of right now, um, they would both, the school district, Greendale School District, would hold the instrumentality for both of those. Correct. Schools. We're exploring them as charters sponsored by the Greendale schools. Um, and that would be that would be the type of charter that it is. Uh, the other chartering authorities are University of Wisconsin system, and there are independent charters that can um, develop. So we are looking at the charter that would be held by a school district. So it's how, how competitive are these grants? Uh, I believe there's 48 potential grants available, and so it just depends on how many people have concepts that they bring forward. What's the timeline right now? So the timeline to submit the grant is February 21st. I will absolutely share the completed grant application. Uh, and then there, I believe it's April that you get um, information on it. It's on the, there's a link in the report. I might be off on my it looks month. like um, so. You're are you going for the two hundred thousand? No, uh, it would. Just the the, there's a one hundred thousand uh, for a school that 20 is twenty to forty nine. Correct. Yeah. That is what we're looking at. Uh, right probably the not the full one hundred thousand because I just don't know that we have one hundred thousand dollars in expenses. We'll apply for actual expenses that we anticipate, which might be travel to visit schools, uh, staff time to build and develop curriculum structures formats. So, so your anticipation at this point, your projection, is that you'll have less than 50 students in Correct. both the 612? In the first year, the yes. Okay. Eventually, um, the virtual charter has a greater capacity to expand and include um, open enrollment students at some point in the future. And so that capacity is less limited than um, uh, the K-5 concept or on Montessori, there would be a, a much smaller capacity depending on facilities that we identify or consider in the process. I don't know. I'm reading the fine print just like um, Rachel. It says, uh, regardless of the subgrant type, planning funds are tied to the projected enrollment and implement implementation applicant may request up to $300,000 in planning. Um, if the school is not able to meet their enrollment projections, the school's overall award will be adjusted. Yes, so we're so not anticipating being go exceeding. Go for the gold. Can, yeah, I don't think we'll exceed 49 in the first year. I, so I think that we are going to be realistic in terms of what our planning is. We know that um, residentially, there's not even a pool of students who would be. We, but, we know that we have about 20 that open enroll in right. virtual charters they, in the state. Do they have to be Greendale students, though? Couldn't they come in from Franklin? or I mean, Absolutely. if you have a public charter here, you could be drawing from other communities. Absolutely, and we will have open enrollment eligibility, um, but we will start small um, with our resident students and limited number of open enrollment seats. And How many other programs are like this? Are virtual any? charters? Or will just, like, uh, district run? Like, oh, there's That's a, lot. a good question. A lot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not just here in Greendale, but statewide. Yeah. I'm asking. You're asking? Yeah. A lot. Yeah. There's a lot. We yeah. have one charter right now. Right. Time for Learning is a charter. And so. But do you, do you know, I mean, maybe another way of asking is how many students or, or what charter, what virtual learning gotcha. opportunities do they, do our students currently enroll, open mm -hmm. enroll out of? Um, McFarland has a virtual charter that Our a number of students that go to uh, Northern Ozaki has a number, um, and Waukesha used to. Each e achieve and Waukesha is still running. Waukesha yeah. used to, and I don't, I haven't looked lately to see how many students are in. And the they Waukesha. all have their own brand name associated mm -hmm. with it. Yep, and I believe Rippin also has one that a number of our students have open enrolled to. So one of the things I wanted to point out is um, this goes in line with district priority number six on your scorecard, um, talking about innovation and remaining competitive and a district of choice for families. Um, can you speak a little bit more? Because this, this is obviously, as you said, going to touch on non-traditional learners. Um, what are some of the benefits? And I, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but um, this 
I mean, this is a lot of work, and what, what in return can we gain from this? 1% of our student, of our uh, school age children in the community choose homeschooling. So that's about 25 to 30 students. 20 of them ha have engaged with the field workshop academic enrichment classes. And in uh, um, conversations with the population, we've been analyzing what is it about the homeschool environment and what is it about uh, field workshop academic enrichment that is attracting them to make that choice. And so by exploring that and um, considering what it might look like from a school-based collective, uh, how can we serve those students? So the benefit is, is that currently 25 to 30 students who choose to not participate in Greendale schools because the tra traditional environment doesn't fit their needs um, may re-engage with our schools and have an impact on our funding and viability as a district. Um, the charter, uh, the 612 virtual charter, the benefit there is we have a number of students who open enroll, and so the district is losing uh, state aid for those students, and the exchange for open enrollment is 8,400-ish. Um, it's between, it's under 9,000, more than 8,000. Um, and so that is money in state aid that the district is losing because that money is transferred to the district in which they enroll for a virtual charter. And... Uh, we're also losing those students uh, from our community. And by having access to a program that serves their needs locally, that we are able to retain them as students, retain the funding associated with them, and have a, an impact on our financial viability as a district. So there's both uh, serving our, school, our student population within the community, that's one benefit, and the second benefit is retaining funding and uh, fiscal viability. So would these students be able to participate then in like the co-curriculars or extracurriculars within our district, say like marching band or robotics? We Under would have review. to I, we would have to identify what that exchange would look like within our um, within the charter conceptual development because we also don't want to accept so many students into a virtual charter that we exceed our capacity to serve them in a brick and mortar space. Um, and so that is an area that we have to consider. Currently, students that are homeschooled by law have the ability to participate in up to two classes at their public schools. However, a student who open enrolls into a virtual school is not able to access two classes in their home community. And so that is because they are open enrolled into the other school. Um, and that is... Uh, an area that we'll have to consider and talk about. Part of the work of identifying what the structure of the charter is, would look like in the planning phase, which is next year, is some interviews with uh, students and families who have cho chosen options that are not a traditional setting and understanding what their needs are so that we can design a school that meets their needs. And if that is a demand that's there, we have to take that into consideration to make the school attractive. And I think, you know, what was kind of heard is that there are state laws that that say when when that home district has what the home district has to offer outside of you know for co for extracurriculars and things like that or co curriculars. Well, and um, if you are instrumentality charter school, there are ways in which you write a charter to say what the district will allow that dis that entity to use. For instance. In Milwaukee Public Schools, they have um, instrumentality charter schools that contract with the school district for special ed support. Um, so that's like an example, but that's all through the charter that would be have to be board approved. Um, so yeah, as a contract. board, we would help oversight some of those decisions. And then to answer the, the question, there's 63 virtual and there's 207 that our district instrumentality charter not all virtual not all virtual that's everybody and yeah. and then 36 independent yeah yeah it's a popular choice um i just want to piggyback on the homeschool comment that kim made and make sure it's part of this discussion that um by wisconsin state statute if space permits wisconsin homeschoolers can attend up to two classes at a local public school, effective July 13, 2015, they can also participate in sports and extracurricular activities on the same basis 
and to the same extent as their public school students, as other public school students. So um, the homeschool students already are allowed to participate in up to two courses if space permits and participate in extracurriculars. So that precedent exists. Um, and obviously, if we get to this point with the charter, um, we would have to discuss that further as far as extracurriculars. So, so and I, um, I think it's a great opportunity. Obviously, it's in the, the, pre, in the beginning phases here. If there is anything we as a board can be attuned to throughout the process if there's other boards that we can even connect with um, from our end just to hear how they as a board are supporting that uh, I'd love to have that discussion as well um, so as you guys are doing the planning keep that as a thought all right yeah I just want to add one more thing I um, I think it's a very wise decision um, to expand our um, opportunities educational opportunities in under this umbrella of customers, right? Um, we know that our the growth in terms of enrollment in our district is kind of flatlining, and we're not anticipating a, a big influx of students with the um, Southridge expansion. And so um, I'm glad to see that the administration is taking advantage of this public school charter option, um, and and especially supporting the field workshop. And that is your doing as a board because you did set it as a goal on your scorecard. All right. Thank myself. <laughs> awesome. Anything else from any board members on this? Rob, did you have anything? I was just going to thank Mary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You're welcome, Bye. Rob. <laughs> All right. We are going to move on to 5.4, uh, school board professional development. I don't believe we've had any since our last that we all shared. Um, any, anybody do anything? No, that was only like three weeks ago. So, Okay, so we'll move on to 5.5, which is our legislative update. Tasha. Yeah, I'm just going to kind of go over a brief summary because I've been talking about a lot of bills that they're um, looking at and they're having um, quite a few bills that are being um, listened to this week. So the Senate is going to vote on nine bills. Um, they're also going to have a public hearing on the establishment of a childhood obesity prevention program and I think they're looking at making it a requirement for K through 8 um, will have three hours, or three hours of physical fitness a week. Um, the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety will hold a hearing on a bill to re to fund positions at the Office of School Safety and Transportation, and the local government will hold a hearing requiring school boards to designate an individual for a committee to consult locally um, for resettled refugees. The assembly will hold public hearings on bills to cover, um, there's quite a few, I'm just listing a few, truancy, um, there's a bill out there that's decoupling private choice and independent charter schools from the public school funding formula and a bill that would require schools to use a community approach to 4K. Wow. Was there any discussion about funding? Uh, you talked about the obesity prevention programming, uh, because my understanding is that's going to increase the amount of hours a week. Um, are, is the state actually increasing minutes, or what is going on? I think they're just in discussion, and I know WSCB isn't exactly in, in favor of it, but I don't know where it's at at the moment. Okay. Besides discussion. And just can I ask a quick question? So, so one of the things I think I heard you say, Tasha, is the, the 4K bill that's coming up for public hearing. Mm -hmm. so, so there's a 4K bill that, um, that requires the community approach to four-year-old kindergarten. Because our school offers a 4K charter program, as a charter, would this bill apply to a charter school, do you know? And, and maybe it's too early to. Yeah. It's a Greendale Schools school. Okay. So it would apply. It would apply, okay. So th this bill would impact Greendale Schools, and it looks like there would be some additional requirements of, of, school, of 4K programs. So is there funding for that? The I think that was the, from WSB. That was the, one of the concerns: is the mm -hmm. the, the the lack of but, funding associated. But it's just a bill, right? It's not a law yet. Correct, correct. And that's oh, what I'm trying to understand: is that you know what, how that impacts Greendale. Okay. Yeah. 
I don't think we can wait till it passes and then ask the question. I'm just a bill. <laughs> no singing. <laughs> okay. All right. Anything else on legislative update? Thank you, Tasha, for always yep. keeping us up to date. You do a great job, by the way. Um, 5.6 is the board committee updates. Any committee updates to talk about tonight? Um, park and Rec is Wednesday. Okay. And then... Um, not necessarily committee, but Canterbury PTO is tomorrow okay. from 6 to 7. That was, they changed their time, right, because it's normally 4, 4 o'clock? There's a few that are 6 to 7. That's nice. Yeah, so tomorrow's a light one. Okay. Uh, the Village Board is meeting tomorrow night um, as well at 6 p.m. They have some really hot ticket items here. If you're interested in knowing what's happening at Green Meadow Lane, and Sterling Court and Houston Street. The 7684th Street project on Grange is, uh, will be discussed. They're declaring Village Days and Family Fourth Fest as public celebration days. They're approving a 10-year parks improvement plan and most exciting, uh, they will be discussing the replacement of the boardroom audience chairs. Oh. Six o'clock tomorrow night. Thank you. All right, and then we have our board calendar update. I know we have senior night at the theater coming soon. What is the date? March 14th. March 14th. Uh, sold out as usual. It's great. I know my mom will be attending. Um, any other updates with the calendar, Dr. Minzik? Uh, there is no school for students on February 16th and February 19th which is why the board is meeting on the fourth Monday, which is February 26th this month. There are, um, as reported in communications, February 20th, there is a Black History Month event at Canterbury Elementary from 5.30 to 8, and uh, board members are... When was the wellness event. event again? The wellness event is February 21st in the evening. Um, so there are two events back to back that week, yeah. um, and I will be attending the Greendale Chamber of Commerce banquet on that Thursday. So it will be a busy week. Uh, conferences are also coming up on January on February fifteenth. And I had a question. Um, thankfully, this year the game day live is not on the same night at the same time as the school board meeting. So we can hopefully attend. That was Wednesday. Uh, two nights from tonight at 7 p.m. The game day live will be in the gym. All right, 7 p.m. All right, so that'll be a good one to come to. As well as um, was mentioned in citizen comments that there will be, uh, I know Explorium had all channels on it last year. It was pretty fun to watch. So if anybody gets a chance, I think that's a great mm. watch party. I would also be remiss to not mention that our G Harmony, which is our a cappella choir, um, has started competing this season. So they also are competing at the quarterfinals for a high school a cappella this Saturday the 10th at Oak Creek High School. But I do think it conflicts with uh, cheer competition. So you have to choose the Panther Pub or Oak Creek High School. Or you just have your cell phone. I'm sorry, not the Panther Pub. Uh, Explorium. Explorium. Okay. Um, anything else, Calendar? Anyone know of anything else coming up? If not, we are at the end of our agenda. Other than additional citizen comments, do I have anyone wishing to speak tonight? Never any pressure. Come on down. Good evening. Hello, Courtney Crookshank Baranowski, 6499 Radburn Lane. I've been a paraprofessional for 16 years and with Greendale School District for four years. As I sat here, I eagerly listened to College Park and the district about what we are doing to cultivate a positive school community. Julie also touched base on staffing. This made me think of our paraprofessionals within our district. The role of paraprofessional can be paradoxical. On one hand, we work with, on the front lines with students who often have some of the most challenging behavioral, learning, and or physical challenges. On the other hand, we typically receive little to no training in spite of the difficult nature of our jobs. More than ever, staffing shortages and challenging student behavior are reported as the biggest problems facing our profession. With these factors in mind, how can teachers, I'm sorry, how can teachers 
the school board and administration more deeply invest in our paraprofessionals so that we feel valued, validated, and more inclined to stay in our positions? And how can we mitigate burnout and cultivate a culture of positivity, ongoing professional development, and open communication? One suggestion I propose is start including paraprofessionals at the table. By bringing paras, teachers, the school board, and administration together with a shared understanding of how roles and responsibilities and an opportunity to be present in decision making and to be able to provide feedback, paras would feel a deeper sense of collaboration within our district and more productive partnership with our district and school communities. Paraprofessionals would feel less isolated in our roles and greater confidence in tackling academic instruction and challenging behavior. As you have probably seen, I've been present to most board meetings. I'm committed to change the views about paraprofessionals and to have them included with more facets of the Greendale School District. Thank you and have a good night tonight. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak that has not spoken? If not, we are on adjournment. Our next meeting is on February 26th at 7 p.m., same place, the Greendale High School Library. Thank you, everyone, and have a nice warm week. It's going to be in the 50s. Thank you.